Assassin from the Sky, Chapter 5, First Part The body of the flying object was constructed of a wooden frame covered by metal foil. The tens of thousands of control nerves spread across the frame, and foil skin were endowed with miraculous regenerative abilities. This was accomplished by a combination of magic and engineering skill. And that was what allowed it to continue flying after a blow from Dee's blade. From the ground all the way up to the stratosphere, a single thread stretched the entire 160,000 feet. And this thread, like the control nerves, was the dark fruit of millennia of repeated collaborations between sorcery and technology. And down on the surface, out in the middle of a plain about sixty miles east of the valley, where Dee and his compatriots were, one of the galloping steeds suddenly halted. Perhaps sensing something? From the back of another Sabo horse came the question, What's wrong, Goshin? It didn't come from a person. Rather, it issued from a black coffin secured with thick chains. And the voice belonged to the person who lay inside it. And the other horses that had halted each bore an identical load. It's odd. The black coffin he'd called Goshen responded. It found D and moved into attack. But his sword got a lick in first. I know this because my flying predator unit has replay capabilities. However, according to communications down the command thread, a malfunction is affecting the FPU. What kind of malfunction? inquired the first coffin. It belonged to the man calling himself Benelli. I don't know. That's why I find it odd. Now that I think of it, when it suffered his attack... I felt a chill run down my spine. Another coffin said irritably, Attack him, and be quick about it. No matter how unsaleable he may fancy himself being on the ground, he won't be able to fend off an attack from the air. Or are you buffeted by the winds of cowardice? Someday I shall make you eat those words. And it will be too late after I've dropped a mini nuke on your head of curls. Stop it, Gorshin and Benelli. A third coffin interjected. From the tenor and gravity of the voice, it was immediately clear it belonged to their leader. As you wish, Lord Jillian. Gorshin's coffin said. The tone changed. There was fright in it. Have the FPU continue its assault. I should like to learn more about the skills of this man called D. First hand. This voice, too, came from a coffin. Gorshin's coffin fell silent. That was the work of suspicion and fear. Below Gillian. Below Gillian. The FPU will only... I know. Attach the control thread to me. Goshen was at a loss. The air around the four coffin-bearing horses froze. The chill was generated by the reluctance of the other three. Goshen. The soft voice shattered the ice. Still glittering, it vanished like steam. I understand... I shall come out now. The tale of Gorshin's words overlapped with a creaking sound. Other sounds joined it. And when the fourth and final creak had ended, four figures stood beside the steeds. A hazy moon glowed in the still deepening blue of the sky. But the moon threw no shadows at their feet. One of them, Zeno Jillian, held out his right hand. His sleeve had been rolled up nearly to his shoulder, exposing an arm that looked terribly thin and weak. 
Caution. The figure he indicated stepped to the fore. The man wore apparel that was dazzling, even in this fragile glasswork of moonlight. And he stood before Gillian and took the man's wrist. Beneath skin as fair as any beauty's, blue veins could be seen. The man with the aquiline nose, Gorshin, hesitated. All eyes were focused on the wrist he held. He pressed his lips to it. An almost blinding line of vermilion streaked across the white skin. And now, your power is mine as well, Julian said in a voice like stone. Now, give me the thread. Goshen pulled his mouth away. Licking his vermilion-stained lips once, he then grasped the index finger of his right hand with his left and tore it clean off. His complexion unchanged, he held out the finger, and surprisingly enough, Julian too twisted a finger off his right hand. They exchanged the digits, and then Julian pressed Goshen's finger against his bloody wound, and that alone was enough to attach it. Not only that, but he could bend and straighten it at will. After testing that several times, Jillian gave a satisfied nod. The thread has been connected. Now to take the true measure of the man called D with his finger. And saying that, he curled the finger like a claw, with not so much as the scar left at the base of it. Page break. It's coming back down. The hoarse voice reported in full tension mode. D had his left hand raised up over his head. Coming back from the stratosphere. This ain't good. Why go up all the way to the stratosphere? Because the nobility had bases up there. Actually, they're still around. We'd best assume it snagged something there. Something. A bomb or missile, for starters. Ah, uh, it's fired on us. Dee's eyes reflected the stars adorning the evening sky. Two of them were rapidly growing larger. It's the aura sensing type. The oldest model. But still, once they lock on, there's no escaping them. Without a sound, D kicked off the ground. Though the jump barely took him off the surface, it carried him more than thirty feet. After he'd made four such bounds, and the black missiles dropping from the sky fixed their sights on the enemy's back, and immediately kicked in their boosters. Sensors set in their noses detected D's aura, even as they read something massive behind him. D was standing with his back against a rock face. His left hand reached out to his side and touched the rock. When it came away, the missiles read an aura there identical to D's own. Without the slightest hesitation, the missiles went for the false D. But a split second before they could strike the rock face, D's right hand flashed into action. As one of the projectiles gouged a fiery crater in the rock face, and the other one shot straight up. Booster still going full throttle, and scored a direct hit on the FPU where it hovered in the stratosphere. Page break. Both the explosion and the death of the device were relayed to the ground through the control thread. Jillian doubled over and a cry of pain escaped him. 
As I expected, Goshen said, nodding morosely. The transplanted control threat transmits any impacts to the person currently controlling it. Even a few nanoseconds of the condensed information is more than a living creature can bear. Even if that creature is a noble. In other words, for a span so brief, it is practically negative time on the cosmic scale. Jillian's body had been subjected to the flames and concussion of a missile. However, as the three cousins watched in amazement, Jillian quickly rose to his feet again. I felt it. Dee's ability. To be able to destroy the sensors on a missile flying at supersonic speeds. Then deflect it to score a direct hit on the FPU. He's a freak. His pale, stiffened face gradually formed a horrible expression. One of malice. With a grin. But now, I recognize these trick. Jillian continued. When we come face to face, I will surely slay him. Mark my words. And then his blazing eyes glared ahead. His eyes were indeed tinted crimson. Goshen, he called to his cousin. Have you the intention of making a new FPU? Of course. How long will it take? And if you would give me but half a day's time, I shall give you a day. A surprise too raw for words swept through the group. But in return, their leader continued. Make it an FPU I can ride. I believe D is not our only foe. And it would seem reports of our revival have reached the ears of Krishkin's descendants. My take is that D's involvement in this matter is purely a coincidence. In order to save the girl, her father or relatives will have sent rescuers after her. We must do away with them before they encounter D and his party. As you wish. Goshen put his hand to his chest and bowed. A dauntless smile rose on a face pure with resolve. Page break. Okay, this is where I leave you folks, the old woman said, throwing both hands into the air. That was a parting gesture unique to this region. But be careful out there, will you? And whatever you do, don't head into Jango's lot. We'll be careful, Dee replied with a nod. And then he asked, Sure you won't come with us? Appreciate the offer, but traveling solo suits my style. I'll see you again, fate be willing. Not asking again, Dee turned his back to Granny. With the stone roadway turned, Pick looked back, and the darkness was swallowing up the figure of the old woman. Strange old girl, ain't she? Being an arms dealer at her age. The enemy has found us. From here on out, best to figure they're watching us at all times. Those were Hiki's words. Dee didn't reply. But he was listening to a low voice issuing from the vicinity of his left hand on a wavelength only he could hear. Better watch out for that one. He's playing innocent. But the way he carries himself, the look in his eye, and the way his hands move, they're all the marks of a pro fighter. Skinny as he is, it wouldn't be strange if he could fly, too. At any rate, seems he tangled with something in the sky over the past that rainy day. Dee said in a voice that no one else could hear naturally. Between rocky walls that towered in the moonlight, only the sound of the Cybercorse's iron-shod hooves echoed. Don't figure he's part of Gillian's bunch. Just the opposite, probably. Hired by that snip of a girl's family. You should put him down, and the sooner the better. It's no concern of mine, said Dee. 
he'd been relieved of his duties. So you say, but you know what they say about fellow travelers making the trip or something. If you don't want to be mixed up in any more of the girl's trouble, you'd best get on a different road real quick. Exactly, Dee replied. In no time at all, they were through the valley and out onto the plains. The wind alone moved dustily across the desolate ground. Well, time for another parting. The hoarse voice gaily called back to the other three riders. So, kid, where are you headed? Do you look at Pick, who was on horseback? Ain't it obvious? Pick replied, puffing out his chest. Not the least bit uncertain, he continued. I'm going with her. After all, the pay is real good. And having said that, the faint cheer that colored his expression changed. For the boy had seen the smile that skimmed across Dee's lips. A warmth filled the boy's chest. Happy trails to ye, the hoarse voice told him, and the figure in black turned his teeth to the right and galloped off in the moonlight. After watching the horse and rider instantly disappear into the darkness, Pick spat. Not the most personable guy ever. Hiki inquired mockingly. Oh, me, I'm glad he's gone. Even though Pick glared at him, Hickey didn't hide his sneer as he said, Well, we should have... His tone was swimming in a self-confidence both the boy and Annette found dubious. First part, and...